Happy Friday, everyone. John Lorden here. Welcome to your weekly episode of Brain Scratch. This one being recorded for July 13th, 2018. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Please keep in mind at the end of today's episode, we will do a comment review from last week's Brain Scratch and thank new supporters via Patreon for this particular episode. So imagine that you are a mother with a young man, 25 years old, going to school overseas and you learn that he has gone missing. Worse than that, a number of days later, his remains are discovered and you don't know if you can trust the investigators that are looking into it. I know, uh, sounds like a nightmare and as we go through this story, you're gonna see that there is just discrepancies and twists all over this. I can't imagine what it's like for this poor family that's going through this. Uh, today, we are looking into the case of 25-year-old Colin Madsen. And let me just thank the Siberian Times. Uh, we're going to be leaning on several of their articles for research here today. They've been doing a very good job of keeping up to date on this case and reporting on it uh, over the years. This is from the 29th of March, 2016. And here, of course, is a picture of Colin. The U.S. citizen is a student at Irkutsk State Linguistic University and visited the tourist destination of Arshan in Buryatia with friends. He left a guest house in the village during the night on 27th of March, evidently without a coat in sub-zero temperatures and has not been seen since, say local sources. His cell phone is unavailable. Mr. Madsen is from Jefferson City, Missouri, and is understood to speak good Russian. Uh, I've looked into some of his social media. I've actually bumped into some YouTube videos of his, and yeah, he even posts videos in full Russian. Uh, from what I understand, he speaks a couple of other languages as well. I think possibly French and Spanish, uh, very worldly young man. And if you look into his social media, you also see plenty of pictures of him traveling the world. Uh, here we have another picture of Colin and another, uh, a lot of these articles are gonna show us the same pictures over and over. Uh, police officers are searching for a 25 year old man who went out of a guest house in Arshan village on the 27th of March between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. and has not yet returned. He was dressed in sand colored trousers, a t-shirt and wore gray hiking boots. Temperatures in the region are around nine Celsius during the day, but dip below freezing at night. So of course, just hearing the basics of this story, uh, very strange. We have this guy that's leaving his guest house for some reason between two and five o'clock in the morning, wearing a t-shirt and hiking boots and some trousers and that's it. But it apparently is freezing outside. Uh, something very strange going on with this case. His mother, Dana Madsen, is flying to Russia to help the search for her missing son. And I have to say, um, for me personally, looking through this story, uh, Dana is kind of the hero in this story to me. She's the one that keeps raising the flag, um, trying to call attention to everything that's going on here. And... I don't know, maybe I'm just feeling it a little more after speaking to uh, Dylan Bright's mother, Heidi, last week, but I just really appreciate um, when people take action like I see these mothers do. I just, it really moves me. Um, over at Siberian Times, once again, concern rises over missing American who aimed to climb Peak of Love. Colin Madsen, 25, enjoyed night walking in Siberia, in Siberia but never came back after going out on Sunday. Police have failed for the third day to locate the U.S. citizen. The case has been put under the special control of the Moscow Department of the Russian Investigative Committee, sometimes called the Russian FBI and the Russian Foreign Ministry. Uh, so we can, we can see things are getting escalated here. I have a feeling um, once word came out that this was an American traveler and his mother is coming to the location, that that kind of bumped up the urgency uh, in terms of the resources that were allocated for this. It, it quickly moved from local resources to having these government level resources coming in. The group had agreed to rise at about 5 a.m. to climb the two 2,412 meter high Peak of Love, a mysterious mountain in the Eastern Cyan Range, but he left two hours earlier. 
He has not been seen since, said a source at the Institute. His cell phone remained at the guest house. Madsen is described by the source as leading a healthy lifestyle and did not drink alcohol. He liked to walk at night in Irkutsk, uh, often talked about it. All the students knew about this hobby, uh, he said. And by he, they're talking about the source, which uh, remains unnamed in this article. Um, even local shamans who blame tourists for getting into trouble because they do not respect ancient traditions and honor sacred sites are helping with the search. The Republic of Buryatia is a Buddhist region. And uh, from other reading I've done, it's actually a mix uh, of Buddhism and you've got some Catholicism there. Um, but there are people that are really honoring these kind of old and ancient traditions. And that's why you have uh, the shamans that are looking to help with this investigation as well. Um, and as you can see from the scenery, it looks beautiful. Not exactly the type of place um, I might go for a vacation, but I can certainly understand why, uh, why he would like to go there. And from what I understand, it also was not his first time uh, in this area. He had gone to this area previously. Uh, and done just about the same hike. Poor weather is preventing helicopter searches, friend Vlad Rasputin said. It snows and there are strong winds, so the flight was moved to tomorrow. I asked the police whether they were looking for Colin with dogs. They said that in the morning when Colin vanished, it began to snow, so dogs cannot pick up the trace. Um, I don't know if I've ever heard about that before in terms of snow necessarily hampering um, sense. If you know anything about that, please share it in the comment box with the rest of us. Uh, but from what I understand, the thing that actually hampers a dog's ability to smell the most is heat. Uh, smells kind of ride on the moisture in the air. Um, of course, I don't know if the air is really that moist when it's snowing as well, because of course it's freezing. Uh, I, I just, I don't know about that, but if you guys do, please share some links with us in the comments below. The peak of love is the focus of ancient beliefs about the power of spirits. Over at WTOP.com, US student missing in Siberia, found dead April 4th of 2016. Colin Madsen's body was found by rescuers about a mile from the village where he had disappeared. Russian police had earlier opened a possible murder inquiry into Madsen's vanishing, but Monday's statement said there were no signs of outward injury in Madsen's body or any indication he had been robbed. Investigators said a cause of death has not yet been established, but the statement suggested that it may be related to drugs. Uh, kind of interesting for a guy that people are saying is uh, very healthy and doesn't even uh, consume alcohol. But that's not to say that, you know, maybe he doesn't partake in other things. Police are now testing Madsen's body for traces of narcotics. And the statement noted that the group with which Madsen had been traveling had taken drugs in the day before his disappearance. Uh, the statement is actually going to be in the description box below, but it needs to be translated. So be sure that you open it, uh, maybe in Google Chrome or something that has a translation plugin for you. Madsen had been traveling with three friends, two local Russians, and another American student on exchange at the same university. The friends have told police that Madsen had intended to join them on an early morning hike, but when they woke up, they found him missing and all of his equipment still laid out. A um, little bit of an interesting turn there, and we're going to get some more description about what he did, but he basically got ready for this hike the night before. He had everything packed up for this hike. So, in terms of intent, which is something I'm always looking at when I'm reviewing cases like this, his intent is clear. You know, he took this trip to go hiking up that mountain. Uh, he got ready the night before, got all his stuff laid out. So it certainly seems like his intent was to go hiking up that mountain. A number of Madsen's friends have told ABC News that it was uncharacteristic of him to leave without warning in the middle of the night or without appropriate clothing. The friends traveling with him have told police Madsen had been behaving normally before he disappeared and that he was excited for the day's hike. Police have said the group had not quarreled in the day before Madsen left. And of course, I think they're touching on um, a theory that most of you are probably getting to at this point too. You know, uh, guys traveling with some friends, all of a sudden guy winds up dead. What really happened there? And now we're starting to hear that possibly these friends were partying with some type of narcotic. Did something go wrong? Do we have an overdose situation where they went and hid him after the fact or something along those lines? Or 
Uh, did everyone party a little too hard? Some type of disagreement or argument broke out, something along those lines. Um, so I'm pretty sure that's why the article is addressing that. We're going to find some more details as we roll forward here that might help you decide if you think that, that is really a viable theory or not. Um, I left this article in because I just wanted to show you what was happening in the media at this time. This is literally the same day, April 4th, 2016. Uh, and this is uh, Prava, pravdareport.com, which I am not familiar with as a news source. But look at this title here. U.S. student dies in Russia over drug overdose. Seems uh, like they have clearly already gotten the information to say that it was certainly a drug overdose. Based off the last article, I don't think they really have that info. But if we go here even into the subtitle, the investigative committee believes that the student may have died because of drug overdose. So uh, I just, I don't know, it always gets me when I see something this kind of clickbaity and then literally in their next statement, they're cleaning it up saying, well, you know, this particularly, this particular committee says maybe this is what happened. Uh, this is terrible from my perspective for the family. Um, and this is, you know, on the fourth, for this case in particular, on the 4th of April, there are articles just ripping all over the internet about this case, all of them with different little pieces of information. But I can't imagine anyone in his family reading that title and then, you know, reading statements like this at the bottom. Apparently, Colin Madsen, while intoxicated, went out into the woods and then froze, being unable to find his way back. I just, I don't know how this type of media is helpful. Uh, once again, on the 4th of April, 2016, this is back at Siberian Times, which I have found to be, I think, pretty fair in terms of what they're reporting and their information certainly lines up with other sources I've seen uh, to the point where some sources seem to actually be copying the Siberian Times and just reposting it. Daily Mail. Okay, that's enough. I've said enough about it. Moving forward. Uh, initial local TV reports suggest he had numerous injuries. Just more strange information. Um, we heard, and I looked at the statement for myself from the Russian authorities, that there seemed to be no injuries. Well, here, Siberian Times, who I think is doing a pretty good job, they're saying that the local TV reports were saying he had numerous energies, uh, injuries, which might indicate murder. And keep in mind, we also had the authorities that were treating this as a murder inquiry pretty much right from the start. But later, it was suggested he may have frozen to death. Uh, just wanted to stop here on this photo. This is him with his mother, uh, Dana. Earlier, Madsen's mother, Dana, had promised to pay 100,000 rubles for any useful information about her son's whereabouts. Police had earlier quizzed his friends using a polygraph. The Russian investigative committee last week opened a murder probe into Madsen's disappearance. So once again, it certainly seems like there's a lot of things going in the direction of there's some foul play uh, going on here, but we never quite get there because the statement is released. It's saying, no, it just looks like possibly he was using drugs and he froze to death. This article also has some comments that I found interesting. This one in particular from Missy in Jefferson City, USA. I'm still confused as to why they say he left two hours before the hike. How do they know he left two hours and not 30 minutes or three hours? I think that's a really interesting question, especially when you have the people that he's staying with uh, saying that they were sleeping. They're not exactly sure when he left. Um, we're going to get to some information by the end of this that might help us clear that up. The article mentions drugs. They smoke something called chemia in that area. It's marijuana that has been soaked in some chemicals. The idea isn't far-fetched that he smoked something, his body got overheated, he went outside to cool off, and since he was high, got lost and kept on going. Um, I don't know if it's really that far-fetched either. You know, we talk about a lot of cases here in the U.S. in particular where we have uh, college students, young men that seem to get uh, very intoxicated and then wind up in water sources. And we're kind of, it feels like this case has the same type of elements going on initially. I think you guys are going to feel a little bit different by the time we get to this, the end of this episode. I, I know I certainly did. Uh, over at NBCNews.com, the grieving mother of a U.S. student whose body was found in Siberia has accused local authorities of a cover-up over his death. Uh, this is an article from April 7th. So keep in mind, April 4th, we just have, you know, all kinds of articles coming out, people talking every which way about this case. 
I think it really got to his mother and she wound up um, posting on Facebook and that kind of spurred all of these articles that happened a couple days later. Dana Madsen Calcutt believes her son, Colin Madsen, was likely killed. Uh, once again, an amazing picture of Colin. It looks like he was in a place where he was very much enjoying weather that maybe not everyone uh, would, would seem to enjoy. Uh, there were no obvious signs of injury. His clothing was intact and he was carrying personal items and money, the committee said in a statement issued in Russian. The investigation will have to determine why a lightly dressed student left the, get ha the guest house without warning friends and left for the forest, it added. The student's mother, who has traveled to Siberia to retrieve his body, said alcohol was not involved in his death and blamed misinformation that made her son appear foolish. Back over at the Siberian Times, April 7th, 2016, my son was likely murdered, says mother of US student found dead in Siberia. She accuses police of ineptitude, misinformation, and cover up. Dana Madsen Calcutt accuses police in the Republic of Buryatia of failing to search properly for her 25-year-old son, who she fears was killed. And then it mentions in a stinging Facebook post. And a lot of the rest of this article is basically just quoting pieces of that Facebook post. Um, one thing I did want to show you guys here is this set of photos. Uh, his passport was on him. It looks like there's a wallet under that. Uh, we've got everything that would be in someone's wallet down to a AAA card, credit cards, um, all kinds of stuff that was found in his wallet, student ID, uh, and cash, even an American dollar in there, all found in his wallet. So any theory about potential robbery probably doesn't fit here. I think it makes sense why... Um, Investigators have ruled that out so quickly. So let's jump over to Facebook to Dana's post and uh, see what she wanted to clear up. She was very adamant about the fact that media seemed to be getting several things wrong and she was looking for help. So let's we're going to read this one word for word. I want to know if any of you can help me get the right information about Colin out to the press. There is so much misinformation out there that it makes him appear foolish and they are simply not correct. It is very hurtful to his family. A, he did not go out in a t-shirt. It was a long sleeve thermal shirt. Um, and keep in mind guys, they're saying that it was uh, freezing temperatures. Obviously for us here in the US, if we're talking Fahrenheit, we're talking about 30 degrees. If you're talking Celsius, you're talking about zero. I now have some experience living in an area like that. And I have to say, uh, going out in around 30 degrees in a long sleeve shirt, certainly possible. And I got to tell you, I see some people that have probably lived here their whole lives actually in shorts at about 30 to 40 degrees. So I don't think it is all that far out there that he might have left the guest house wearing only a long sleeve shirt. Um, and it kind of depends on how much time he was spending on on. Uh, how much time he was intending on spending outside, which we're going to get to as well. B, there is no substantiation that he went or told anyone he was going outside for a walk. The bathrooms are outside in an outhouse. So uh, very important to understand that. Th this is not the type of guest house where you could just go walk down a hallway and into the bathroom. This place is basically almost like a log cabin. I think we're going to bump into some pictures by the end of this. Uh, so for him to have used the bathroom, he was going to have to go outside anyway. Is it possible that he needed to get up in the middle of the night to go use the bathroom? I certainly think that that's possible. Uh, C, if Colin did any drugs, which we don't know, he would have smoked marijuana and that was hours before this event occurred. There was no alcohol involved. Now, I don't know if um, she is tying the time frame of the marijuana smoking to information that came out of his friends uh, about the fact that they may, they may have smoked a little earlier in that day. Um, I think that's pretty much the only source that I've been able to find on that. And even then, you're, we're going to find out that maybe that story doesn't quite completely hold up as well. Uh, yeah, I'm very curious about that. And quite honestly, I don't know. Can you smoke enough? I guess if you got high enough to the point where you went outside and you became disoriented or confused about which direction you were going and you walked off into the wilderness somehow, um, I think 
maybe that that could be possible. And I do think that is the story that the investigators are trying to push. How reasonable is it with the information that we're still going to review? I'll let you guys decide. D, there were not sub-zero temps that night. I had been told it was warm, and if anyone knows Colin, he had an incredible tolerance to cool weather. E, he was familiar with this place that he loved to hike, spoke fluent Russian, and had his pack, water, and food ready for the climb. Those things were left at the cabin. F, he was found a mile away, one day after the Russian FBI came. Not huddled or covered with leaves, but flat on his back in grass, with his sleeves pushed up, his boots unlaced, no socks on, his eyes and mouth open. He was not in snow, but on the grass under a tree. So here we get some of the first details about um, how he was actually found. And once again, if we're talking about a situation where he was getting up in the middle of the night and he thought he was just going to walk over to the outhouse, uh, would you necessarily put your socks on if you thought you were just going to be out there for a minute or two and you wanted to come back and get back into bed and try to rest up for your big hike the next day? Maybe not. This seems very reasonable to me in terms of how he was found that he thought he might have just been going out to use the restroom. Could something else have happened to him? Could he have been intercepted on the way? Um, you know, could he have gotten lost because, you know, he was amazingly high or something like that? I think we can keep those things in consideration, at least in this point, at this point in the conversation. But it is interesting that he is found laying on his back. I've never really heard of a case like that, particularly for someone that has supposedly frozen to death. Um, it's a very strange way for his body to be found. Uh, let's go ahead and continue with, with her comments here. And how did they know that his body was found this? We know this as an unscrupulous rescuer took his photo and sold it to a Russian tabloid. G. We know he wasn't suicidal. He was excited about wanting to work in the embassy in Vladivostok or the UN. Uh, obviously, with the way he was getting ready for his hike the next day, I don't think he was suicidal either. Once again, his intent is showing that he is very much looking forward to that next day. It was the whole point of them making that trip. Um, H, he loved his friends and family. I believe that the local police here did not do their job and even to me made innuendos and remarks that were defamatory about Colin when they didn't know him and should have been looking for him. I think they were trying to cover up the ineptitude that occurred before we came and the pressure to find him was accelerated. I think she makes a really good point here. I do think that there was likely some pressure added to the local authorities. We already know just by looking at the fact that there was government resources that were all that were all of a sudden coming on here. Um, we know that there was some pressure behind this. Maybe it was a mix of the media, the fact that this story was becoming international. Now you had this mother coming to look for her son. Um, there might have been a lot of pressure added to this situation. Help me if you can get the right information out there. He deserves better than this. Corruption, cover up abounds here in this place, but I am so grateful for the Russian FBI, all of the volunteers, and Colin's dear, dear friends. I also want to tell all of you how proud I am to be from the U.S. Our two consulate friends from the Moscow U.S. Embassy, Courtney and Vasily, have been by our side every step of the way with compassion, wisdom, and love. The murder investigation is still open, and I hate to even think it, but I believe, barring some medical catastrophe like an aneurysm or pulmonary embolus, that is likely. He would have never walked to a place in the pitch dark with his shoes unlaced, no socks, and when he was leaving for a climb in just a few hours that he was so excited about. Thanks, my friends, for all your love and support. The autopsy was done yesterday, and I hate to say it was in this place. Colin will be taken to Irkutsk today, and then we will fly to Moscow and home, hopefully in a few days. I have so many other things to tell you about this debacle, but I might not ever be ready to talk about it. Uh, you can certainly hear the pain in her post and how emotionally charged it is. Um, and once again, just with the media that I've reviewed on this case that all came out a day or two before that, I, I totally understand uh, why she was so emotional and why she felt like she needed to get those clarifications out there. Pretty big difference saying this kid went out in sub-zero temperatures in a t-shirt, which 
all of a sudden makes you think of the possibility, wow, he must have been out of his mind for some reason compared to, yeah, it wasn't really sub-zero and it was a thermal long sleeve mm, and the bathroom was outside. It just, it really changes the context of this case for me, knowing those details. Back at the Siberian Times, 15th of April, 2016, cops accused missing US man's friends of killing him while failing to launch search. So if we didn't think the situation was bad enough, wait till we hear what his friends went through here. Two Russian friends of 25-year-old student Colin Madsen have made serious allegations about the handling of the search for the American man. They claim that during interrogations, they were wrongly accused of his murder and told they had committed sexual acts on his body as they were pressured into making confessions. The allegations from his fellow students came in online at News Babber, I think it is. Um, unfortunately, this link is broken, but they have most of the pertinent information here, I believe. Quote, when Colin went missing, for the whole day we tried unsuccessfully to contact the police for help. They were quoted as saying, despite this, the investigators immediately began to push the theory that his disappearance was our fault or his own fault. More pictures of Colin here from an earlier trip in Siberia from 2013. Before he disappeared in the middle of the night, nothing had appeared wrong, they said. After returning from a walk, we cooked dinner and discussed tomorrow's journey. It was decided to get up at 5 a.m. to go out no later than 7 a.m. Colin prepared for the trip in advance, gathering his backpack, put in several bottles of water. He asked to wake him up just before the start of the trip because unlike us, he was ready for the hike and wanted to sleep longer. He went to bed, closed the door with a key. The time was exactly 2 a.m. When they got up at 5 a.m., Colin was not in the house. They made a quick search in the yard and nearby. The friend stated, it was quite warm outside, no wind. We went down to the river nearby. We briefly examined the shore, washed up, and returned to the house. Of course, we were worried, but we were confident that our friend would come back by 7 a.m. because he was a very responsible person. When he did not come, at this time, we panicked. Uh, really important that I want to point out there, here we have one of his friends specifically talking about what it was like the following morning when they went outside. And that friend is saying there was no wind and it was pretty warm. Uh, once again, just discrepancies that are very hard to line up here. Um, they added that it is quite easy to enter the yard of the house, uh, the guest house that they were staying at, because the gates are not closed by a lock. Later, the owner of the house told the students that such cases happened. Once, someone even tried to break into the house while he was sleeping. This information, by the way, was of no interest for the investigators. The owner still has not been questioned. Uh, it just, it grabs me a little bit because I'm thinking of a situation here where Colin thought he was going out to go to the bathroom. And if we know that there had been people, um, uh, being around this house, possibly trying to break in it in some way, uh, could someone have done something to him on a short walk for, uh, wherever he was to the outhouse. I don't have good information. I couldn't find solid info on how far the outhouse was from the actual home, but here we're finding out that people were actually creeping around the home, at least at one point, according to the guy that owns it. The friend said, we came back and started to think about different options of what could have happened. The most obvious version was that he might have injured his leg as he went down the steep riverbank. In case Colin came back, we asked the second American, Lucas, not to leave the house and went to search. We came back with no luck and checked Colin's possessions. He left his jacket and a down vest, a backpack and water bottles. On the bed lay a t-shirt that he wore on Saturday. There was no money and no documents. By all appearances, they were in the pockets of his trousers, which were on him. His phone was broken, so he did not take it to Arshan. So his phone wasn't even with them. Uh, so I know we read information earlier that made it sound like the phone was actually left in the guest house. According to what they're saying here, uh, he didn't have a phone at all because he had broken it earlier. Then they took a car and searched the village and suburbs without luck. They then decided to call the police. However, the Arshon police station was closed. They checked the local hospital, but Madsen was not there. They recounted an apparent nightmare 
in trying and failing to reach the emergency services, notably the police. Uh, and there's more details about it. They're finding phone numbers. They're calling these phone numbers. No one's answering the phone. No message systems. Uh, they're, they're getting the phone number of a local cop that is just off duty. They're trying to call him, can't get him. Uh, it does literally sound like a nightmare. Guest house where friends stopped for the night before Colin disappeared. So here are the photos of the guest house they were staying in. Like I said, it's kind of built like a log cabin. Um, and unfortunately, there's no interiors. I think we'll find some interiors a bit later. You can see a note that they left there. Colin, stay here. We'll be right back. Get in touch with the neighbor. Um, Obviously, they were trying everything they could to, to find him. Finally, after more calls, after formally reporting Madsen is missing, the police arrived. The pair were taken to the police station where officers from the investigation committee seemed more concerned to frame them than to look for the missing American. The IC officers immediately showered us with insults and threats and even accusations of murder, they said. This occurred in the presence of the local police whom the investigators treated with marked disdain. According to the IC officers, we got drunk until we were helpless or smoked spice, synthetic drugs, quarreled, and this all provoked the crime. They urged us to confess to the murder, threatening to send to the press hate, uh, which is apparently is a sweat box or a prison cell where prisoners are ordered by police to beat confessions out of new arrivals. These investigators threatened us during the investigation and even after Colin was found. We felt that we were being provoked, that they tried to throw us off balance because a normal person just cannot listen calmly to such things about his missing friend. I certainly understand that. From the first minute, the investigators made it clear that they did not like us. They did not like our appearance. It was also strange to them that we did not have alcohol, but had books with us. So it was concluded that we killed Colin and then made sexual intercourse on his dead body. They also voiced the version that we had dismembered and buried his body. The time passed by, but no one started the search for Colin. It was very difficult to endure. When during a search in the house, the investigators found knives and saws, they started offensively telling us how we killed Colin with these things. It seemed no one was going to search for Colin, that all efforts were aimed at the investigation of us. There is something kind of odd to me that you have people coming to tell you someone's missing, and instead of getting search teams out, they're spending time drilling these guys, you know, trying to get possibly some type of confession out of them or something. Uh, instead of going to find the person who might still be alive out there or maybe injured and could be rescued. Um, but it's like they're not even considering that, which is what I find really strange. It's one thing to say, hey, look, this situation looks weird to us. We need to put these guys in some type of lockup and we need to interrogate them. You know, let's have a couple of officers stay back here and do that. We're going to go ahead and kick off the search. According to what these guys are saying, that is not what happened. The proper search did not start even on Monday, the day after he had vanished. So we have time that is just burning by where if Colin is hurt and out there, uh, there's no chance of him being rescued because people aren't necessarily looking for him. On Tuesday, we were checked on a polygraph. Even this procedure seemed aimed at pressuring us. The questions were like, have you ever seen Colin beaten? Did you commit a crime? If yes, would you say this to the police? After the polygraph, investigators told them they had not passed the test and offered to beat them to make them speak properly. Um, I don't know if it's accurate that they actually didn't pass the test. There's some information we're going to get to later that says that they actually did. I think that it is a, uh, it's a procedure sometimes that they will lie to people about polygraph results to try to elicit a reaction out of them. And that might have been what was going on here. Then three rescuers arrived. They immediately announced that it was pointless to search for Colin in the mountains, that hundreds of people were needed for this, so they would not go anywhere. We spent an hour persuading them to explore the road to the peak of love, since according to investigators, Colin might have gone there. In the following days, we checked several areas. We want to note that many ordinary policemen and some investigators sincerely tried to help us in the search and did a lot. We are sincerely grateful to them that they reacted to the situation as humans. 
I think that is extremely well worded. And I really appreciate that despite the fact that it seems like these guys were pretty seriously mistreated at this point, they're recognizing that there are people out there that are actually trying to help them. I think Dana kind of touched on this uh, as well. And just that statement that they're reacting to the situation as humans, that really strikes me. I wish that uh, we could trust people in those positions to always treat these situations humanely. One of the policemen introduced us to an amateur paraglider. He agreed to observe from the air a few areas and did it as soon as the weather permitted. Uh, it also says that he didn't charge them much, that there was a little bit paid for him to do that. Uh, Madsen's friends also came from Irkutsk to take part. However, a large number of rescuers only appeared after the student's mother, Dana Madsen Calcutt, arrived from America to search for her missing son. So even according to them, it does seem like once Dana showed up, uh, that was a new change in the situation. I don't know if it was more pressure. Uh, I think it, it likely was. 11 days after his body was found on the 4th of April, there has been no disclosure of the results of toxicology tests, nor any further details released by the authorities. Um, really strange. We get a statement from them about their conclusion, and unfortunately, the information to back that conclusion seems to be stalling. The friend stated, after all, if Colin really froze to death, a search promptly organized on the 27th of March could have saved him. Why, as soon as they were able to get the police, did they begin to make us confess to his murder, although it was less than a day after he was gone? It does raise some really interesting questions uh, for me, even the potential of, did these guys know where he was? And they knew that they didn't have to go out looking for him. Uh, so that's why they felt fine spending all their time hammering on the roommates. An anonymous local policeman has also raised questions about the handling of the case. The American's body was found by rescuers at a height of one and a half thousand meters, he said. Despite the sufficient height of the slope, it is not a place where you can get lost, especially if you have visited this place four times as Madsen had done. The village is clearly visible from there even at night because there are street lights in Arshan. Now a preliminary version is hypothermia, but it is just because there is no visible injuries such as cuts or traces of bullets, for example. This examination does not rule out poisoning or breaking the neck, for example. Uh, once again, just making very good uh, common sense judgment. Why are we rushing to these conclusions about we know what happened here? Yeah, this guy got too messed up and then he went out and froze. Uh, you know, have the medical examiner wait for that detail to come out. Why, why are you sending this information to the press at all before having real firm conclusions? Once again, just the activity around everything that's going on here, I can, I can understand Dana's perspective that she thinks there's a cover up because the activity around this does not seem like it was very well thought out and it does seem haphazard uh, and sloppy. Uh, Siberian Times, 14th of May, 2016. So now rolling forward a little over a month. State investigators rule out murder. The investigative committee, equivalent of the FBI, insisted on Friday that he died of exposure to the cold after going out for a walk in the middle of the night. Uh, once again, we've already heard from Dana's information. He is found laying on his back, not in a fetal position, like typically if you're going to freeze to death, you probably would be found in. Forensic ep experts confirmed that the U.S. citizen died because of the low temperature, uh, that he froze to death, said a statement. He left the village without any warm clothes and there were freezing temperatures at night. Once again, we're hearing that same old narrative that quite honestly, uh, we have some good reasons to question. Investigators said that traces of THC indicating use of cannabis were found in mass Madsen's body and on friends he was with. The friends of the deceased man during the preliminary interrogation confessed that on the 26th of March during the entire day, they took drugs, marijuana mixed with tobacco, the statement said. Friends now face criminal charges over possession and use of cannabis, which is banned in Russia. So if the situation wasn't bad enough and if they weren't treated badly enough, uh, now they're going to be charged for 
smoking pot. A friend familiar with the case admitted that the two Russians on the trip had smoked some tiny amount of marijuana mixed with tobacco, but vigorously denied they had smoked all day long. The friend also stated that the Russians did not admit to investigators that Madsen had smoked cannabis because they did not know whether he did or not. Even if Colin smoked, this could not have caused his death nor made him mad. It is nonsense, said the source, who also disputed that the temperatures at night were freezing. So now we have someone else that's saying it wasn't freezing that night. That night was warm. It became colder only the next morning after it started snowing at about 8 a.m. The source made clear that Madsen's Russian friends do not believe that he just froze to death. So Colin's body is eventually brought back to the U.S., and thankfully, some more people are taking a look at this to see, uh, is there something else really going on with this case? Back at the SiberianTimes.com from the 15th of October, 2016, U.S. pathologist found suspicious marks on U.S. men who officially died of hypothermia in Siberia. Dana Madsen Calcutt has accused the law enforcement authorities of a cover-up and claimed that a U.S. pathologist found suspicious marks on her son's head and wrists. She argues that analysis of the American students' remains after they were flown to the U.S. indicate he was hit on the head with a blunt object. The pathologist deemed Colin's death suspicious, and it is now being reviewed by a forensics expert here, said his mother. Uh, very interesting, and how do we not uh, wonder what the heck is going on with this case now, especially if they're finding that he might have had blunt force trauma to the head and some type of markings found on his wrists. Uh, she also claimed that the American embassy in Moscow has sent four diplomatic notes to the Russian authorities and has not received responses to them. And what about the drug testing? Well, we're going to find some disputes there too. Investigators further concluded that he died under the influence of marijuana and that tests confirmed traces of THC and PB22, which I hadn't found any other sources about, uh, which is a synthetic designer drug in the urine of the deceased. Madsen's mother strongly disputes the Russian findings and says that an American drug screen on her son's remains was negative. While the initial Russian toxicology results, which she has obtained, were also statistically negative for THC in his urine and completely negative in the blood, hair, and nails, despite the latter claim about drug use. So I believe what she's talking about is the level of THC they did find uh, was not statistically relevant. Basically, they found some, but the level was probably so low that it wouldn't support the thought or theory that he had smoked it within a reasonable amount of time for it to have been a risk factor in his death. The allegation of drug use is a lie to try and deflect from what happened, she alleged. It didn't beat him with a blunt object or put identical marks around both wrists. Uh, I believe the whole affair is a cover-up and a poor one at that. A motive for a Russian law enforcement cover-up is not clear, but she implied that there may have been local suspicions that her son and his group of friends were gay. She said this was not the case. When she arrived in Russia shortly before his body was found, she had a very disturbing conversation with a policeman, which she found to be inappropriate and frightening. I knew Colin would not be found alive after I talked to him. He was spitting with hatred and contempt as he thought those men should not be staying together without girls or alcohol. He kept trying to get me to say Colin liked boys. When I was exhausted and in utter disbelief, I told him Colin had a girlfriend at home and I saw pure fear. Her theory is that her son got up to go to the toilet in the night and that he was then attacked. He knew this area of Buryatia and would not have voluntarily walked into the mountains at night without being properly dressed, she said. Colin also had bilateral ankle surgery the year before and could not hike or walk very far without socks, she said. The boots rubbed on the scars without socks and it really bothered him. Yet, he was found with unlaced shoes and no socks, completely clean shoes, I might add. Uh, kind of interesting, and we're going to hear a little more information about the status of his clothes possibly being too clean. Um, in terms of the shoes being unlaced, you know, if I was 
making a quick run out to an outhouse, I might not lace them up. And in particular, now we have an even better reason for him to not lace them up if he has scars that he doesn't want to inflame. So it might make sense why his boots actually were unlaced if he wasn't wearing socks. Uh, his bladder was very full on autopsy. I know he was going out to the bathroom. She also claimed that she and her family and embassy staff were not allowed to see or know where Colin was found. The crime scene report from Russia says there are no witnesses due to the difficult terrain, but in the crime scene photos, there are at least 10 men sitting comfortably around where Colin was found. She said she does not suspect her son's Russian friends. Um, it's a really good question, and I I just, I don't feel it in this case. We certainly don't have any information to really think that they might be involved here. Uh, and with how hard they were pressed by the Russian authorities, who I don't even know if they were being on the up and up. I think that these guys caught a lot more grief than they actually deserve. But think, if you were really guilty and these guys were leaning on you that hard, you still got out of that situation without being arrested. I don't know. I, I, I think... I think it's a fair conclusion that she's making. I believe those men to be completely innocent, she said. I believe it was the police or someone related or known by the police, but it has been a bumbled cover-up from the beginning. When Colin was sent home from Russia, I did not know how he would come home, and I had a coffin and clothes ready for him. It was when the funeral home removed his heavy makeup, suit, and white undergarments that they noted the suspicious marks and called forensics. Um, that is a really interesting development. So it was actually uh, them preparing his body seemingly for a funeral where they stopped and said, hold on a second, we've got marks here that don't make sense. And then additional forensics were run off of that. Um, very, very strange outcome. The US Embassy declined to say if it was satisfied with the Russian investigation. Quote, we have closely monitored local authorities' investigation into the cause of death, said a spokesperson. We refer you to the Russian authorities on their investigation. We have no power to conduct investigations on Russian territory. Out of respect for Mr. Madsen's family during this difficult time, we have no further comment. And that's part of what makes this situation so tough. Um, you're going to people here in the US, you're going to people that you think have some type of authority or are able to help you. And ultimately, because we're dealing with an occurrence that happened in another country, there is a big stopgap at how far that help can reach and, and try to rectify this situation. Uh, at a website called panorama.nl, uh, this is from July 9th of 2017. An English professor and his American wife, living in the United Kingdom, are suing the Russian police for sweeping under the carpet the true circumstances under which their beloved son would have died. Uh, I know it's worded a little clunky. The parents asked President Putin to reopen the case. They also asked U.S. President Trump to cooperate, as it is ultimately a U.S. citizen who has been murdered here. So... They're even they're reaching for everyone they can that's in a position of power to try to um, do some more work on this case and to try to bring it to a fair conclusion. And that's probably what bothers me most about this case in particular is it doesn't feel like a fair conclusion. It feels like a narrative that was driven right from the get go. And they've continued to drive despite the fact that we now have. Uh, some scientific evidence that's even countering what their conclusion is, but we don't have a mechanism for that evidence to actually make a change with their conclusion. It's really, really frustrating. And like I said, I can't imagine what this family is going through. Madsen ended up beneath a large tree, his body resting on its back on wilted spring vegetation with an extended left arm and clenched fists. Now, we're gonna get into some detail here about how his body was found. I also did find a link to the picture that was leaked to that ridiculous news source that would post that. Um, I did take a look at it for myself because I wanna try to understand this better. Um, these descriptions are exactly fair. It, he's not in snow. You can't see snow anywhere in the photo at all. It looks like, kind of like sp springtime. And outside of that, uh, the vegetation that they're talking about isn't even necessarily all dead. There is plenty of green grass that is still around him as well. So just speaking to the weather conditions of that time period, 
it's really not making sense. And then there's a lot of other big questions that come up um, in part with that photo, but also with the further analysis that happens back here in the US. Madsen's mother, Dana Calcutt, had traveled to Arshan shortly after her son vanished to participate in the search. 15 months later, Calcutt believes there is even greater reason to suspect foul play in her son's death. An analysis she commissioned from US-based forensic scientists who examined a range of case materials has concluded that there is strong evidence that her son was physically abused and died in the process. I think something happened and they didn't want it to appear that an American had been murdered in Russia, Calcutt told RFERL. That's the website that we're looking at. Uh, Madsen's love of the outdoors had led him to volunteer with environmental groups in the area. He helped build hiking trails, volunteered with local activists from Greenpeace, uh, participated in several protests. Months before his death, Calcutt said he had even received a warning letter from local authorities about his participation in some protests. Uh, but he was a trusting person a friend said on condition of anonymity, citing concerns about potential retribution from authorities. It's possible he may have been hoodwinked and jumped, the friend added. Now we're going to get into some of the details that are countering kind of the uh, investigator's conclusion. A Russian drug screening included in investigative materials seen by R RFERL came back negative in tests of his hair, blood, and nails, but it states that Madsen's urine test revealed the main urinary metabolite of cannabis products with a concentration of 16.6 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, Atal Johnston, a toxicology expert at Queen Mary University of London, told RFERL that the concentration that was found in Madsen's urine, according to the Russian investigation, suggests he could have smoked or ingested cannabis up to several days prior to his disappearance but he said it was definitely not a large amount. The traces could have remained in his urine for several days if his body were outside in cool temperatures, Johnston added. A laboratory at Washington University in St. Louis also conducted a toxicology test on Madsen's liver. It came back negative for a range of drugs, including cannabis. Authorities conducted a drug screening on at least one other member of the group that Madsen had been staying with and planned to hike with. That test, which was conducted three days after Madsen's body was found and seen by RFERL, came back negative for controlled substances. Calcutt and her husband proceeded to commission an independent examination of their son's death. They reached out to the Colorado-based Independent Forensic Services. The experts observed that the reported stiffness of Madsen's body at the crime scene, such as his seemingly clenched fists, suggested that he may have been alive for several days after his disappearance. They added that based on weather conditions and temperatures, it is very unlikely the victim was lying in the forest for eight days and that one would expect greater damage to his body from animals had it been at the site for that period of time. Um, I have to say, you know, I've seen all kinds of photos of uh, different sites like this and what they're saying makes complete and total sense. Uh, it looks like he was literally laid at that site maybe a day before that photo was taken. Now, I am not an expert, but here we do have experts that are basically coming to that conclusion as well. Um, the body, it, it, lo it looks hardly touched and uh, typical things that you'd see in terms of decomposition don't seem to really be happening there. Um, it's really, really odd. Um, it is unlikely that the victim died on the location where he was found, the analysis states. Other suspicious circumstances include injuries all over Madsen's body that are not explained by running through the woods and injuries on his hands and wrists that indicate the victim had been held. The injuries on the body and the tearing of his clothing do indicate that the victim was in some sort of fight. Now, that's a little interesting because according to the official story we heard before, clothing was found um, perfect and everything was found on him. So obviously it wasn't a robbery. Well, now we're hearing that's not quite the case, that some of his clothing was actually tore. Uh, I believe even his underwear and his pants might have had tears. Uh, very, very strange. 
Calcutt told RFERL that she is drafting a letter to send to the White House's Russia Point person, Fiona Hill, seeking assistance in the matter, and that she plans to send the same letter to U.S. President Donald Trump. Uh, interesting site here called Russian Gate, um, and they have a photo of a pendant here that is going to become very interesting. Uh, just keep that photo in mind. The examination found that his underwear and trousers were torn after the victim's death and that the clothes looked as if they had been washed. What the heck is going on with this case? Um, that is really, really bizarre to me. Uh, might explain why uh, his boots aren't laced up. Uh, if someone did take his clothing off, washed his clothes, put them back on his body, uh, and then just kind of threw his boots on. Also, this one is really uh, the kicker for me. In the photographs from the location of the body, there was no necklace that Colin wore around his neck. But then the police handed it over to the mother of the deceased. Where did the police take it from? The lace on which the pendant hangs is connected in two places as if it was torn in a fight. And that is why we have the question right under the picture, how did the police obtain this necklace that Colin was wearing on his neck when we have pictures of his body that don't show the necklace around his neck? Uh, also, uh, in autopsy records performed in Russia, there was mention that traces from a shoe were found on the body, but the police report did not mention this. So once again, we're just getting all these small pieces that really point towards some type of physical altercation that uh, happened and then and for some bizarre reason was covered up. Uh, the first examination could not establish the exact time of death. It could have been up to five days from the time he went missing. And back at the Siberian Times, and let me just say, uh, if you guys are only going to read one additional article outside of watching this video, I'd say to make it this one. This is kind of a comprehensive article where they've pulled together a lot of information from their previous articles. I'll make sure to put this at the very top of the sources section in the description box below. This one is from the 2nd of April, 2018. Two years on, US mother offers $10,000 reward for evidence of murder of her son in Siberia. And once again, we see the picture of Dana and Colin, and we have some quotes from her. Colin would have been 27 on the 18th of February, and it has been over two years since I last saw him. I think it would save others in Siberia if we could find and prosecute these murderers of innocence. Uh, this article goes on to talk about shamans that had made some predictions here. One of them said that the American would be found dead more than a week after he vanished. Uh, I don't know if that is the most incredible prediction I've ever heard. Uh, and then another one was certain several days after Colin vanished that he was still alive. And this article is even pointing out that that is possible, that maybe he was, especially after the information that we've just reviewed. And what happened with the family reaching out to Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump? Their efforts fell on deaf ears, but they refused to give up. We came here with one of Colin's friends on the trip, uh, Dmitry Emelyanov, 31, a sales representative, who returned to Arshan for the first time since these horrific events. Uh, and the we that they're talking about, I believe, is the Siberian Times. They don't make that really clear. Uh, once again, here's a photo of the place where they were staying. And now we see some photos of the interior also, uh, which basically all look like one room and just raises one question where I heard his friend had mentioned that Colin had locked the door uh, and then they went to sleep. I'm assuming that he means the front door because there are no bedrooms. Uh, when I initially read that, I thought they were talking about a bedroom door, but it looks like this is all just one big uh, square area. Back to the information from his friend, Dimitri. Uh, that night, the student had been his normal self, calm, funny, and confident, Dimitri said. If ever there was a conflict, Colin tried to resolve it and always saw the good in everyone. He loved life and wanted to discover everything. 
He had made a wide circle of friends in his three years studying in Siberia. Uh, I can also tell you guys, looking through comments on these numerous articles, several people uh, say that they were friendly with him and he was one of the nicest guys that they had ever met. Uh, several of them commented on his spirituality. Uh, I bumped into some videos of his uh, where he was discussing meditation and things like that. This guy uh, really seemed like a very kind, kind spirit. I was the last person to hear Colin's steps, Dimitri said. The four men were sharing the primitive shack with a stove and six beds ahead of their hike. They went to sleep at 2 a.m. and were due up at 5. Um, Colin came back from the outside toilet, and I heard him closing and locking the door, insisted Dimitri. I saw him sitting on his bed. That was it. We went asleep, and the three of us heard nothing. Either Colin never fell asleep, or he went out again before going to bed possibly to the toilet again, or just to get some fresh air. I woke up in three hours and Colin was missing. So a little more detail in terms of the timing there and what was heard. Uh, I do think it's interesting that Colin went out to use the bathroom uh, when his friends were still up, which kind of raises the question about, well, how many times do you have to go out and use the bathroom? But uh, who knows? I mean, it just completely depends on the person, depends on how much uh, they're drinking, not alcohol, just water. Um, the friends all passed the polygraph check. So here's the one reference I can get that actually says that they've passed the polygraph. And they also underwent drug tests and those tests showed that they were clean. Uh, so I'm not even sure about buying the story that these guys admitted to uh, smoking marijuana that day. Only a handful of rescuers were deployed and the friends even paid themselves for a motorized hang glider to conduct an aerial search. We mentioned that before, but here's an interesting tidbit. His route took him over a small clearing in the woods where Colin's body would later be found, but he saw no sign of the student. Uh, now I can tell you from reviewing the picture, uh, Colin's body was found very close to a tree. So, uh, I, I, I don't know if the clearing that they're talking about here uh, is all that clear, because uh, I imagine if you were flying over it just with the, fo the foliage from the tree, uh, you might have not been able to see him. But they're definitely alluding to the fact that, uh, that he should have been seen and he wasn't. And of course, if his body wasn't there at the time, that would totally make sense. And when we're talking about the other evidence that has come out since it's been back in the U.S. and analyzed, it seems like there is a very strong possibility that his body was not there at the time. Hypothermia victims are usually in the fetal position. Colin was stretched out on his back. Very, very strange. The night he disappeared was mild. I wore only a t-shirt at 5 a.m., said Dimitri. The Russians said he probably got lost in the mountains, but he had lived in Irk Irkutsk, uh, for three years and knew them well and even acted as a guide. I got to say, it's already hard enough for me to say these areas, but when they misspell it, it really throws me off. Um, we don't think he died here, he added, Dimitri, showing us the site. He was placed there to be found. Colin's discovery came soon after the arrival of a crack team of investigators from Moscow, who locals are convinced were, in fact, not police, but officers from the powerful FSB, Russia's security service once headed by Putin. Yet, there is no official record of either top Moscow investigators or the FSB being present, even though one of Colin's friends was interviewed by a Lubyanka agent for two hours. So what happened? The local shamans seem reluctant to say. And what about the other American student that was with Colin? There was another troubling aspect. Lucas had tried to go back to his study in Irkutsk after Colin's death. Uh, then suddenly he said the Russian state fixed its eyes on me. He left Russia after taking advice from the US embassy. I left Russia out of fear that I would be detained, he said. I got a ticket back to the States and was on a plane within 24 hours. And we just have this kind of sad resolve when it comes at the end of this. Efforts of the family and their supporters have failed to convince the Russian authorities to reopen the case. Now they hope the reward will bring a vital extra clue to enable new legal action. It is really just a hard way to end this episode. I just feel like I wish that there was something uh, some mechanism or path that these people could take that would definitely give them a better chance at 
learning the truth of what happened here, it just does not feel like it's likely. Uh, even to the point of there is actually a change petition uh, at change.org here, which I'm definitely going to have a link to down below. And I encourage you guys, if you've been moved by this episode to sign as well, and I'm going to be signing it myself, but it's already got over 100,000 signatures. And we're still not seeing anything that I think is reasonable movement in terms of this uh, being reinvestigated in some way. So here's where I turn it over to you, Brain Scratchers. What do you think is going on with this case? Let's talk about it in the comments below. Um, my heart just breaks for Colin's family uh, and his friends. It just seemed like he was a guy that touched a lot of lives. Uh, seemed like that there was a lot of good that he could have done in this world. And unfortunately, we will never be the benefactors of that because of whatever happened uh, out in the wilderness in the middle of the night. Uh, of course, before we end today's episode, we are going to review some comments from last week's episode, which was the interview with Heidi, uh, Dylan Bright's mother. First comment I want to talk about is Stephanie's. Dylan's mother is such a sweet lady. My heart broke hearing what his sister said. Uh, definitely, definitely. That really got to me as well. Uh, my brother has always been my best friend. How unfair to lose one, especially like this. What a beautiful family he has. I really hope they get answers. Raven V, hearing her say, I am not a powerful and wealthy person, so what can I do? Just broke my heart because it should not take power and or wealth to get help or answers or effort in cases like this. This world we live in can be so crazy at times. Uh, Raven, I think you could basically copy and paste that exact same comment into today's episode. I feel the exact same way. Uh, and these are people that I think do actually have some financial resources. But at this point, with this particular case, it is a matter of power that is needed. And it needs to be some type of international power. I don't know, who do you appeal to, to try to say, hey, look, I got really screwed over in this other country. What can we do about it? I just, I don't think there's any mechanism for that. A Mommy's Life vlog says, my heart is broken for Heidi. I can't imagine losing one of my kids. I don't care what he did in the past. Something seems off about this case and the police work seems less than stellar for him because of his past. Fundraising should be done to hire a PI just to take a look and see if there is something the police aren't seeing or aren't saying to this poor family. Prayers, there are answers and peace for them all. Very well said, Amami's Life Vlog. And uh, I will reach out to Heidi just to let her know that suggestion. I, I do think that uh, potentially if they do some type of fundraiser on that, specifically for a PI to take a look, it might not be a bad thing in this case. Uh, it might help just to have someone kind of, you know, hitting the streets and asking around about that. Really good idea. And Brandy Bay 81 I also want to thank Heidi for sharing all the pictures of Dylan and his family. They are a beautiful family. You can tell they're close and love each other very much. Uh, definitely. And Heidi, I want to thank you for that too. It really helps for us to understand what's going on. Uh, not only the pictures of your family, um, to see their joy when they're all together and to know, unfortunately, that Dylan isn't going to be a part of that going forward, but to see how they were celebrating his life at the life celebration. Uh, and in particular, the pictures of the area uh, with the notes that you had written that helped give us a much better understanding of what was going on in terms of where he was found. Um, and I just got to tell you guys, I've been in touch with Heidi since. She sent me uh, just a, a really, really nice and caring message. And I'm trying to do the same back to her. I've even forwarded some messages that people have sent me privately. Uh, I've heard from other people that have been really moved by this case that are looking to try to get other people to help on it. Um, it's one that has really touched all of us in a very uh, strong way and in a way, I hate that these things happen to people, but I do feel very special that in some small way, uh, I can be a part of their journey in terms of trying to help them. Uh, and yeah, Heidi really made that clear to me throughout the interview, after the interview. Uh, I'm just so privileged to be in the spot that I'm in, and that's because of you guys. I can't do it without you. Now, before my voice goes out, because man, this was a long episode, uh, I want to thank Patreon supporters, new Patreon supporters that have come on over the past week. First one is Barbara Dahlia Gordon, not Lorden, Gordon, almost, almost as cool of a last name as mine, Barbara. Hi there. Thank you so much for your support. 
Chris Marie, good pal of mine that I chat with a lot on Twitter. Hey, Chris, uh, Kiernoth, or Kiernoth, hope I'm getting that right. What's up, Kiernoth? Margot Burton, also a new patron. Uh, Anna Joe, a new patron, as well as Alexis Shorts and Laura Ricketts. Thank each and every one of you for your support. I truly appreciate it. On top of that, we have, I think it's Anacro. Hope I'm saying that right. And Yang Moon, who have increased their pledge. Thank you very much. And if you guys want to join on the patron support, all you have to do is go to lordandarts.com, look in the upper right hand corner. I've got a button right there for you. We do uh, a couple giveaways every month. Uh, some other special things that I do for people that have uh, been contributing for a while. So if you want to be a part of that, you can join it there. Thank you so much, everyone. Please take care of yourselves. Have a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you back here on the Lord and Arts channel on Monday. <laughs>